give it up one more time. This movie fucking rules. I got to see this at Sundance. I got to see this with an audience of people who were freaking out while they were watching it in the best way possible. I'm sure you get a lot of people telling you that they couldn't watch it or this or that. The audience that I saw it with was loving it. This film is sexy, it's funny, it's, in, it's beautifully made, and it's also shocking in the best way possible. So let's, let's talk about where this, how this started for you. What was the sort of germ of the idea that, how, it, how did it start? <laughs> uh, it's not a, the thing is that I can't say a lot in front of you guys because I don't want to make any spoilers, so you're gonna have to apologize if I just try to sneak around this question because otherwise you won't go see the movie because you will know everything about it already. Um, so um, the first thing is that it's, there, it's not like, it didn't start from an image or something, it started from a conversation that I had with my producer, Jean de Forêt. Um, he was not my producer at the time, but we were friends already, and uh, we were thinking about um, cannibal movies that we've seen and liked. And I told him it's interesting because in cannibal movies, most of the time, cannibals are referred as they, and they are filmed as they. The direction goes like they are, you know, put uh, aside in the movie, like they're a heart, a heart or something, or a group of people that is menacing um, the, the heroes. And uh, I thought it's funny because me, when I hear they, or when I see they in the direction, I'm think thinking about like creatures from outer space, or a heart of zombies, or anything that uh, does not exist, you know. And I, I told Jean, it's strange because that we treat cannibals this way in cannibal movies because cannibals are real people and they do exist. It's not something that we fantasized about, that we imagined and stuff, that we created. It, they do exist. Cannibal movies come from some real things, you know, some real facts. And, um, and I told him if I, had to, uh, if I had to make a cannibal movie, I think I would try to make it uh, by saying I instead of they. Because I, I'm thinking since they are real people, they're real human beings, I would like to understand what's the difference between me and them and how you get to do that for the first time and cross the line where we would all have stopped, you know? And I think it's interesting to, um, to, uh, to see that the, the way we portray them as they is kind of a repression of, uh, of this part of humanity that is incredibly repulsive and dark, but the reason why it's so repulsive is because it's part of us, you know, it's part of all our community here on Earth, and that's why it's so scary for us to, 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 to admit that. But I do believe that movies are made uh, for us to grow up. When we see movies that have touched me throughout my whole life, or movies that changed my point of view on people, on myself, on humanity, and that made us grow up. And I don't believe that anyone grows up by repressing things. So I wanted to try to tackle this subject for that reason. Do you feel like, and this may not be for you to say, but do you feel like you succeeded in sort of getting rid of the other when it comes to cannibals? Because it's a challenging thing to set out to do, even if you're telling it from the perspective of a cannibal, your main character is a, is a cannibal. At the same time, you are still trying to sort of non-otherize something that is foreign to everybody. What do you mean when you mean others? I didn't get your question, I think. Well, you said that you want, you didn't want it to be they, you wanted yeah. it to be I. Mm. But even if your main character is the one that's a cannibal, mm. I'd imagine it's still hard to make it mm. not they for the audience. Of course. Well, the first thing is that she's in all the shots. So, I mean, we are always, always with her. She's the main character of the movie. Um, but indeed, the main challenge when I was writing the movie was to build up the empathy on her in spite of the repulsive act that she was going to commit. So uh, it was a big, you know, it's a, it, it was a big build up. It was a big strategy. I had to build up the empathy since the beginning of the movie. And that's why, as you've seen maybe a little bit in the trailer, uh, the triggering context is hazing in a, in, in a vet school. And uh, I thought that by building up this establishment that is anonymous and cruel and misogynist and, you know, very um, violent as well, well, I, I thought that instinctively the audience would root for her, you know, because no one wants to be on their side. So since the beginning, we would be with her and we would feel for her. We would be scared for her that she goes through this uh, violence uh, right away when she gets to school. So that's one of the, of the strategies that I use. I also think the use of hazing and the cruelty of the mobs at the beginning of the film illustrate this idea that 
you know, we are literally and me metaphorically sort of feeding off of each other. We all have a desire to, in, in certain ways, feed off each other. Hers much more literally, but still, we it, it seemed like a juxtaposition to me. Did you intend that? Of course, of course. There is a big parallel. I mean, when we're talking, I was talking about the cannibalism of my character, but that is um, that reveals also many types of the, of, um, of cannibalism, of interpersonal uh, devouring, if you wish, um, in society and in the way uh, people treat each other in general, and especially in this hazing ritual that magnifies for me this kind of violence that we feel um, generally every day when we hear, for example, that uh, a politician stole the money. It's the case in France nowadays. I don't know if you heard. Stole our money and is never going to give it, and we have to pay for it. And I think this kind of violence that comes from upstairs, you know, and that makes us a very, very, like, you know, feel like we're everything we have is being eaten, you know, like they're taking things from us, you know. And so I think that, of course, this metaphorical aspect and political aspect exists uh, very strongly in my movie. And it exists also at the level of love, of a too much of love, of a, of a love that is uh, also devouring and, uh, and where we consume each other. Um, there are many, many different ways that I try to tackle the subject of cannibalism. Uh, without giving anything away, uh, one of the elements of your film is about not just cannibalism, but female desire and it itself being taboo. And you sort of make it even more taboo almost by making it cannibalism to a degree. Oh, well, that's, that's the exact opposite that I try to do. I'm, I'm not sorry saying, you feel like that. No, 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 no. Excuse me. I mean, I, I felt like you were trying to talk about it that way. I, I didn't think that you were trying to make female desire taboo. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, no, the idea was really, of course, well, let's say that for me, um, cannibalism, um, let's say, triggers sexuality. It's not sexuality that triggers cannibalism. The thing is that when she realizes that she has passions and that she, she yields to it and uh, she can't do anything but yielding to it because it's in her, it's eating her from inside. Uh, this is also a moment where she becomes freer than she was when she enters the movie, you know. She, she actually is for the first time in touch with her body and for, for her feelings, her sensations and stuff like that. And it was very important for me to, uh, let's say, to portray a sexuality in a female body that was the opposite of taboo, actually, because I think that nowadays the female body is considered taboo if it's not sexual sexualized or if it's not glamorized. You know, we don't see the triviality in female bodies anywhere, on our screen or in ads or you, you name it. I don't see it anywhere. And I think it's a shame because I do believe that the triviality of bodies, whether they are male or female, is aiming, I mean, it's, it, it, it makes us all equal. We all have suffering bodies, we all have desiring bodies with needs, we all want to climax, and this is absolutely normal because this is how we are made. We are also a part of animality in us that we have to let express and everything, and, and I don't see that in, 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 uh, in the way our female bodies are treated, and I really try to take the female body outside of its niche to make it universal, so that everyone can identify with it, and not just women, and you know, not just yeah. the people who are concerned, just everyone just because, for example, considering a certain scene in the movie, you don't need to, uh, you, 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 you know, sorry, that when hair pulls on skin, for example, it's, it's painful. It is painful, you know. And I decided to um, really try to film the body in a very intimate way, in a very close way, in a very relatable way, so that this, the experience that she um, undergoes as a, a female post-teenager can talk to even a man who's 50 and can identify with it, with her pain and with her needs. Can I try that question one more time? Uh, so I, I didn't necessarily mean the female body as something that is taboo. I meant agency and desire and sort of making their desire in this film the ultimate taboo cannibalism, it's sort of a reflection of how society generally treats female desire and agency. Does that make sense? You're going great. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're saying really. Are you saying that basically the only times that the only times that female desire female desire is treated in movies or on screen in general is through monstrosity? I think it's rarely depicted, and when it is depicted, it is depicted in some ways through monstrosity. When I think of American films, a lot of times there was a, a, a phase of 
big Hollywood comedies where a, for a woman to be funny a lot of the times, they had to be overly sexual. And that was an intimidating thing for the male leads in comedies. So we had this kind of disturbing trend, I think, all through cinema where women were rarely the ones desiring. They were the, always just the ones that were desired. And when they had desire, it was a horror show of some kind, or it was intimidating for the male characters. In this, it's all about their desire. But their desire is also something that is naturally taboo or horrifying. But I don't think if it's natural, it's not taboo. We completely disagree on that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I but <laughs> I think the way you, the, the way you, I did not want to portray something that was uh, repulsive. I tried to make something repulsive become relatable. That is different. But you wouldn't agree that you were starting from that cannibalism initial from a starting point as taboo. I would agree with you that you got to that place by the end of the film. But you're starting with this idea that you're starting with something that's taboo. Well, cannibalism is taboo, yes. Yeah, but that's not, what I'm saying. Not yeah. the female sexuality. It's two different things. I completely, I completely agree. We ha might have to take this conversation to the green room for the sake of moving on right here, but I have more questions for you in regards to this. Uh, talk to me about sort of your, your, your filmmaking influences because it's, it's beautifully rendered, and as I told you before, there's this wonderful shot at the beginning of the film that is all one shot. It's through this party, incredibly well choreographed. You know, was that from a specific influence? Where did that idea come from, and what was the choreography like putting that together? Uh, this, technically speaking, was on paper the hardest shot I had to do. But I created myself, so I really wanted to make it hard. Because I do think that when, when you decide to go for a sequence shot, sequence shot is when a full scene is never cut. It's all in one, in one shot. I mean, I think uh, you have to, you know, you have to... Um, uh, to get to, you know, you get to have a lot to see for your money in a way, you know, when you decide to do that, because making a sequence shot for, of two people who have a conversation in a room, well, okay, that's not very challenging, is it? So I decided to really, like, yeah, raise a bit uh, the bar of the expectation. And actually, when I was choreographing and I was talking to my DOP, he was like, no, we're good now, no, we're going to this room, and then we're going to this, and I'm like, there is something missing. Can the guy go? like above the camera being held by everyone and the camera follows him like this and stuff. Can the camera make a 360? He's like, uh, sure. I'm like, <laughs> then maybe we should add a dog to this scene with the 300 extras because, and can he act in the, you know, in the shot? And he looks at me like, oh my God, we're never gonna make it. And it was actually, I mean, that was incredibly challenging because in this shot, indeed, there are 300 extras plus 50% of the crew. So it, it's, it's in a basement. It was incredibly claustrophobic. Everything I had planned and choreographed and everyone knew what they had to do. I directed every single extra to tell him, you have got to do this, you have got to do that. At this moment, the camera goes here, you do that and everything. Because if one person like messes up, basically, you have to take 350% back to scratch and you lose like one hour and a half and when you only have one day to do it, you're pretty much fucked. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it was really like super, super, uh, a big uh, common effort of focusing on the right thing and um, a lot of music, so that was a very tiring day because it's a big party. And I'm personally the kind of horrible person that when I watch a movie and there is a party scene, I'm gonna look in the fourth ground to see if one of the extra pretends to dance when there is no music. <laughs> and if I see that, I just run away. I'm like, come on, it takes me out of that. I'm really a horrible audience. <laughs> and so I really wanted to be sure that would not happen with this scene. And so, and so yeah, in the end it was very, Super painstaking, super, super challenging and everything, but we managed to get two full perfect takes. And after that, we were like... Two full perfect takes? Yeah, it's 10 wow. takes in the day because you have like five to six hours of prep with everyone on set. It takes a very long time to, you know, to build up the setup with everyone on set. So you only have 10 takes in the end, maximum. And the two last ones were absolutely perfect. Now, I have to ask, when had you worked with this DP before, your director of photography? No, the first time. So when you sort of tell him everything that you want to do, or her, excuse me, uh, you tell them everything that you want to do. There's going to be someone floating over you. You're going to bring dogs. And they look at you and say, oh, geez. How confident do you have to be in your vision to be able to say to that person, no, this is what we're doing. I'm sorry if it seems hard, but this is what we're going to do. 
but there is no other option. I mean, I don't That's even ask myself about. the uh, question. <laughs> well, I just know lots of people. I, 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 you know, I've made stuff, and I've seen other people have made stuff. Who, when the crew tells them that that's going to be hard or we can't do that, they immediately because it's their first movie, or you know, the crew's been doing this many times before them, are like, oh, well, maybe I should change this because of that. It takes a lot of guts to be able to sort of stick to stick to it. Yeah, but I think you also have, you know, to take people on board. You have to get people excited. You know, directing it's also seventy-five percent of psychology on your crew. So you really have to take when you have very hard stuff to do. For example, when you have a full um, a full night when it's outside and it's minus ten degrees Celsius. Sorry for the Fahrenheit. I don't know them. And uh, and it's super cold and super tiring. You have to keep your your your, your crew alive and one you know to make them want to be there because it's really so it's a lot about that. And so my, I I was lucky enough because my DOP was super uh, ambitious as well, and uh, he really liked the challenge. And when at the beginning we actually had started cutting the sequence, and all of a sudden I tell him no 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 we have got to do this sequence you know, sequence shot we have to do it one shot, and he actually got excited with it and everything. So it's not like. We all have doubts, of course, but when there is excitement and when there is, you know, you can just seriously achieve anything. It's really just a matter of believing in your shot. Can we talk about uh, the humor in the film? Because uh, I feel like we we're talking very seriously about the movie, and it is a serious movie, but it's also very funny. You're a very funny filmmaker, and I'm curious, you know, how you knew how much humor to put in, when you knew, and what was it like straddling that line? Well, the thing is that my movie... It's not a horror movie. I'm a crazy horror buff, so I can tell you it's not a horror movie because I did not write a horror movie. For me, when, to, when I want to see a horror movie, I want to be frightened. I want to jump off my seat. I want to yell in the theater, go berserk, and, and, and I really not sleep for at least a week. That's what I accept from a good horror movie. What's a, what, would you, what would you, off the top of your head, what would you say is the <laughs> movie that does that for you? Last time it did <laughs> this to me. If you're gonna say it's super like uh, cheesy, but it's a uh, last time I really, really yelled like in a roller coaster when I was a conjuring too. I was like for two hours like, ah! <laughs> like this. Everyone was looking at me. For what movie? The Conjuring Two. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. There's 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 a lot of really good scares in The Conjuring Two. Yes. It's about an hour and forty minutes too long. Hours, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but still, you know. No, still, seriously, me for two hours, I was telling my friend, I'm not going to stay, I'm not going to stay. I was really on the verge of having a heart attack. Well, he's a but pretty <laughs> filmmaker, too. The movies look pretty. His, no, but his James Wan is a very good director. Yeah. He really knows where to put his camera. He has crazy, crazy shot ideas. The thing with the nun and the shadow. This is just wonderfully beautiful. This is like German surrealism from the 30s. It's gorgeous. No, no, Completely he's a agree. very good director. Anyways, to go back to our business... <laughs> So why am I funny? Uh, tell us a joke. No. <laughs> no, how did you? How you know? How did you know when when to be funny and when not to be? It's I wasn't because getting there, there are moments where it's. I mean, there were moments the audience that I was with and myself were rolling on the floor laughing. It was so good. Specifically, the the the, the wax scene. It's just it's so. No spoiler, fun. no spoiler, no spoiler. I don't think that's spoiled. Why should we talking about that's, wax that's figurines? Spoiler. You don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was getting there indeed, I remember. So that's not a horror movie. It is a crossover between comedy, drama, and body horror, which is already a subgenre in the genre, but that's, a, that's what it is. And um, why do I make crossover? I love crossovers because I love, when, as an audience, I love going through many, many different emotions when I watch a movie, and I love watching a movie not knowing what is it that I'm watching, being like, what the hell is going on? What is it? What am I watching? Is it a thriller? Is it a drama? Is it a comedy? Is it what a, like, for example, I don't know if you've seen Ben Whitley's Kill List, but I really felt like this when I watched it. And that's really what I want to convey. And for me, the eruption of genre in the narration cannot, cannot go without laughter, because laughter really favorizes the genre and catharsizes it. For the catharsis, uh, for example, if you put a comedic scene after a traumatic scene, then you're going to be like, I need this relief. I want to breathe a little bit because it was too much, and you can use comedy like that. If you put it before, then you can put your audience at ease, like, ah, oh, it's a nice scene, I'm really super comfortable and everything, and then bam. And then you can create, a, like, whoa, what's this sensation? And, like, all of a sudden, you get the surprise, you get the drama. So that's, that's why I think they go very well together, and I do think that laughter does not go without drama, because drama gives depth and perspective to laughter. You know, it gives substance to it. Um, it's and character. Character gives out, yeah, character, sorry, go ahead, never mind. Drama, yeah, like darkness, like some, yeah, like the tears. Tears, if you wish, gives depth to laughter, and vice versa, actually. And anyway, so I do think that these three, uh, these three elements for me are really not separate. Uh, we can't separate it. I mean, in my head, and this is exactly how I see, um, 
how I see life, and this is how I am in life, and that's why there is a lot of dark humor in the movie. I have a lot. I mean, I'm always very sarcastic and stuff like that. I have, I, 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 I do very dark humor jokes all the time. This is, so for me, it's very natural to to use it in my dialogues. And the second thing is that I do believe very strongly that when you laugh with a character at the beginning of a, move, of a movie, not at, but with, it really creates a bond between you and the character that lasts for the whole movie. Because it's really like, it's a, it's a complicity. Like he becomes an accomplice and you're an accomplice with that person. So uh, it's very important for me in my strategy of building up the empathy of my character to make us laugh with her at the beginning, at her awkwardness and the fact that she's aware of it and stuff like that with her body and stuff. And also with the dialogues, of course. So that was also um, a part of this to build up the, the empathy of the character. You used the phrase uh, body horror just a, just a minute ago. Um, Cronenberg is obviously the sort of reigning king of, of body horror, uh, I would say, and ha definitely has a, a bit of an influence on this film. Just I, I heard you talk about a little bit about him at Sundance when I saw the film. I'm curious, just from my own sense of curiosity, who would else would you consider body horror? He's the reigning king, but who else does body horror? I agree with you. I totally agree with you. He's like, there is almost no, no one yeah. in the body horror business. I mean, it's not, that must not pay very well. In the and 80s, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the 80s, there's like a few films here and there that pop Braindead. up. Brain Dead. Exactly. Brain Dead is body horror. Brain it's dead. super funny, by the way. Yeah. I mean, if you like this kind of funny, but I find it super Wait, which, funny. Which, not the Peter Jackson brain dead, the brain... No, no, I'm talking about the Peter Jackson oh, brain yeah. dead. You didn't find it funny. No, of course <laughs> it's funny, it's the best. It's so funny. Your mother ate my dog. It's like the best movie. <laughs> exactly, and that's body horror, one, yeah, really 101. And it's, but you're right, there are not a lot if I think of it. I mean, let me, let me, let me. No, yeah, not so much. I've seen the Greasy Strangler recently. Is it, oh, yeah. is it possible to say that somehow there is some kind of body horror in it? Because yes. It's all about yes. the body and it's yeah. super disgusting. But super funny, it's a comedy, you should see it. It's completely wacko. Yeah. And uh, yeah. There's a few, yeah, there's a few mo disparate sort of 80s horror movies here and there that I can remember that are kind of body horror, but they're a little over the top. But uh, yeah, there's very few, very few are made. He's really the reigning king at this point. I agree with you. Um, let's uh, take some questions right here. Hey, Julie. Hi. Um, I was wondering what the casting process was like. Uh, what were you looking for in your, uh, the lead character, at least? And did they know what they were getting into, uh, how graphic or what the content of the movie was going to be like? Well, when, when it comes to, um, once I had done the casting, and I will go back to the beginning of your, your question af uh, afterwards, uh, yes, of course they knew what they were getting into. I mean, I'm really, you have to be super clear with your, with your actors, especially when some scenes are incredibly physical and some scenes are naked and stuff like that. You have got to, to tell them very early on what they, yeah, what's the train they're boarding on, you know? And, and uh, fortunately enough, the three of them, um, really found uh, something to defend in that movie, personally and, you know, in their vision of life, of the world and everything, they found some depth in it. That is, indeed, it's not a shocker, it's not a torture porn, it's something that has, you know, real characters with real issues and stuff like that. So they really liked that, the fact that the characters were real characters and not just, you know, the final girl or, or the, the fuck boy who gets killed the first one or things like this, you know. And then, no, but these are like the archetypes you find in horror movies a lot, you know? So they appreciated that, you know, that they had something to, to munch on, not to make uh, any, any stupid pun, but, but uh, they, yeah, they had something to defend. So that's the first thing. Yes, they knew everything about the movie. The first thing is that you asked me is about casting how I found them. Garance Marillier, who plays the main character. Is amazing, so incredible in this film. Who is indeed an amazing actress. Uh, it's the third movie we, make we have made together. Well, I've known her when uh, I met her when she was 12 and she was the main part of my first short. And now she's 19, so it's been seven years that we've been working together. And she did my TV feature in between. And um, we know each other very well in real life. And so we have built up a very strong work relationship um, that is based on trust. And we trust each other a lot. And also we have the same ambition. So that's super nice because when you work on, a, on such, like, let's say, tough parts, you know, to... Um, to take with you, to bear with you for many months, you know? It's good to be hand in hand, to push the scenes very far, you know, and to know that you, you, can, uh, you can achieve something grand somehow because of this trust and because, again, I'm super transparent with my actor and she's super transparent with me as well. So that's super important. And for Rabba, Rabba is, I met him, Rabba Naitufela, who plays the main uh, male part. Uh, I met him in casting very in a classic way. 
and he just was the best uh, actor I've seen, and I've seen a lot of them, and he really was the best. And also I really admire his intelligence in um, taking on a part like that, because he plays a homosexual. And uh, Rabat originally was a rapper, and he really was like super happy to be playing someone who's not him, who's not a dealer, who's not, you know, these kind of archetypes that are, um, that are unfortunately are the case uh, a lot in, you know, in France, that you take people for archetypes they represent. He was happy to fight the archetypes and to uh, embrace a role that was far from him and that he could defend. So I really admire this kind of intelligence and risk-taking in actors. And Ella, she's a Swiss-German um, actress, Ella Humpf, and I discovered her in a Swiss-German uh, film that's called Krieg, it's, it's called, uh, it means war, and she plays a skinhead uh, in a group of skin skinheads that are only male, she's the only female, and she plays um, a skinhead that is uh, a, woman, a young woman, but uh, who acts like she's a guy. And the first time I saw the movie, I did not, I did not realize that it was a girl playing this part. And I told, I told my producer, but there is no girl in this movie, why did I watch it? He said, but that's her. I'm like, what? And the transformation is just crazy, especially that in real life she's super frail and everything, and that she was like super tough and very, very like, um, yeah, kind of like a warrior, if you wish, you know. And I really was looking for this kind of personality and self self confidence for the part of Alexia. Next question. Hi. Okay. Hi. I love that you guys brought up Dead Alive. By the way, it's like one of my favorite horror movies, and I like introducing it to people like during Halloween time. But um, about Brain the, Dead, you know, the, the, yeah. Dead Alive, Brain Dead, it's two different titles. Um, about the trailer, it's really captivating and it's really intense, and I think. What drew me to it the most was the score and the choice to have no dialogue in the trailer. It, I was wondering if you were responsible, had any involvement in packaging the trailer, and what was your choice to not have any dialogue feature in the trailer? Well, I didn't. I did not uh, edit the trailer. Uh, the people from Focus World did, and they did a very great job indeed. However, they sent me, uh, if you want, uh, different tryouts, and I told them what I wanted. You know, um, what was my preference and what I wish I wanted, what kind of uh, atmosphere I wanted to convey, what kind of feelings I wanted to convey, and stuff like that. We pretty much all agreed on the fact that there should be no dialogues in it. And they found the music that is amazing. That's not in the movie, but it's amazing why. Because in my movie, the score and the pre-existing music are super important. There is a lot of music in my movie, and it has a lot of importance to me. And it's kind of rock and roll. There is also a hip-hop song in the movie. And I think that the music they found, that I don't know who, by the way, Shauna could tell us later, but uh, who, who did this song. But it, I think it really, really... Um, conveys the spirit of the movie that is at the same time dark but super energetic. I think I have time for one more question right here. Hi. So my friend and I, we both go to NYU. We're grad students in cinema studies right across the street. Congrats. And we went to see the film at Film Society of Lincoln Center on Tuesday. And there was a woman after at the Q&A that just interrupted you and said, but why did you make this movie? You're just droning on and on. She was really provoked by the film. And I wanted to know, how do you make a film with all these shocking images and there's really grotesque stuff, but you don't just make it provocative for its own sake. You talked about that you didn't want to make a film that was just shocking or provocative just for its own sake. How do you make it connect to the characters and to the themes that you're talking about? Uh, the first thing is that I really hate grat gratuitous violence because it's really, not because it shocks me, it's just that it has no effect on me at one point, you know, after five minutes, I kind of have the feeling that I've seen it all and then I don't care about the characters anymore. If it's just to see people being killed and bloodbath, I'm like, eh, you know, it doesn't make me want to follow the story at all. I really need characters. Originally, I'm really only a screenwriter, and I, I came to directing when I was in film school. So, but for me, the first thing is the story. The first thing is the story and the characters. So in order, if you want to not, um, to not be uh, uh, provocative for nothing or shocking for nothing, you really have to balance in your head what you have to show and what you don't need to show. And, um, for example, I ask myself a lot, because, of course, when you tackle a certain imagery, you kind of, like, have doubts sometimes. Like, uh, am I in the right... Is it the right note for my movie? Am I going too far? I, and I'm thinking, yeah, if... I have to show cannibals. It's a movie about cannibalism. I have to show cannibals. Otherwise, why would I have chosen this particular subject if I don't show it? I could not avoid my topic. My topic. So I knew that I was going to show acts, but this act had, had to make sense in my character's journey. 
And that's why, actually, in the movie, there are only three scenes that are hard to watch. That's all. And these three, three scenes are indeed very explicit, but it's not through the whole movie. Otherwise, no one, again, would have found an interest in staying. The important thing is to show that this person has pulsions, and at one point you have got to, 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 to show what these pulsions have as an effect. And so the founding act of cannibalism was the mo most important thing to show for me. And then afterwards, uh, one more time to show how she's trying to fight her pulsions and how you know, she, she starts feeling guilty about that and that she does not want to be like this. So that's all, you know, it was really just about, it had to make sense um, with uh, how my character was feel, feeling inside uh, and, and not more. And that was, you know, I, I never thought like, oh, I could do this, I could uh, make her eat brains because it's funny and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I never thought about that. If it's just for my own sake, I'd rather not show it, you know, and just, or do it for me with little figurines, you know, with Warhammer thing when I'm at home. But that's all. <laughs> You said that you, uh, you personally don't like gr gratuitous violence, and I don't think the movie is gratuitous at all. It's actually, it's violent, or it's gruesome in the moments that it needs to be, and it's actually one of the things that I was surprised about when I saw it was I was expecting it to be far more shocking considering the reports that I heard, and what I actually found was just a really well-made body horror movie that had a few shocking moments. But you love horror movies, but you don't like gratuitous violence. Do you think there's a sort of cultural misunderstanding about horror movies being gratuitous in, in, in terms of violence? Absolutely, definitely. Not only is there a big misunderstanding about um, the, 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 this gratuitous, so-called gratuitous aspect of horror movies, but there's a misunderstanding about the fact that horror movies are stupid. I agree. I just, you know, in France, I don't know if it's the same here, in France we make the difference in our vocabulary between genre movies and auteur movies. This has never made any sense to me, because for me an auteur is anyone who has a strong and personal vision of the world and who knows how to communicate it and how to film it. Whatever, whichever grammar they use, it can be musical, it can be uh, documentary, horror, drama, comedy, you name it, but it that's can so, be anything. That's so interesting, sorry I don't mean to interrupt, but like it was, I mean, auteur was created by Kaya du Cinema, right? And when they basically started using that word, they used it for directors who were working in genre. It was about John Ford, Howard Hawks, and like Alfred Hitchcock, who Truffaut and Godard would write about. And those guys were actually operating in the sort of old Hollywood genre. So to now split that up makes no sense. No sense. And I can't even explain it. I think it has something to do with like the way the new wave in France has been digested afterwards. <laughs> I can't use this kind of imagery anymore without making a bad pun about my movie, like digested and stuff like that. I have to start <laughs> start speaking like this. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it's uh, where it stops being taken seriously. I don't. I don't understand. I think you're right. I think it's in the new wave and the sort of the French new wave as well as the American new wave, where it was this idea of like a a genreless. Uh, film make, films. You know? Yeah, but it, for me, it's not genreless. On the contrary, it's genre full. Because when you think about Pierrot Le Fou with Belmondo, which is maybe the most famous Godard's movie ever, and number one in every time you, you type best French films ever, you have Pierrot Le Fou number one. Everyone praises it. It mixes at least five different genres. It's crazy. It's a thriller, it's a cop movie, it's a musical, it's a romance, it's a comedy, it's, a t it's everything. And I, you, you think know? of a movie like Mean Streets or something that is like part of the American New Wave, and that is constantly riffing on old gangster movies. It is like a 1930s gangster movie at, at numerous times, which was as genre as you could get for a period of time. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, Raw is coming out this weekend, right? It's coming to theaters this weekend. It's so fantastic on the 10th. On the 10th. Uh, I love the film so much. I'm so glad I got to see it and got the chance to talk to you. And we're going to continue our conversation back there because we're sure. going to figure out this whole female desire All thing. Right. Uh, Raw comes out this weekend. Julia, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Julia.